would like to start out by having you all imagine something for me. Um, I want you to picture a house. Not just any house, uh, it needs to have a pitched roof and a front door and some windows. So really from the information I've given you, there's not a lot to really go by. So the chances of me understanding what it is each of you are imagining is almost impossible. Um, it could be anything from as simple as this um, to any of these sorts of examples here. Now the reason for that is it's very limited information and each of you get to interpret that information as you like. So within the AEC industry, to solve that sort of thing, we have all these, uh, these documentation standards. So this allows us to make sure that everyone's on the same page and everything is drawn or documented exactly and therefore everyone understands what they're meant to be doing and what they expect from the project. However, if you don't know how to read this sort of information, um, it's not that great. It doesn't really give you the ability to interpret and it, you're sort of lost and you can imagine anything just like that house example. So this cartoon's been around for a while and it does a great job of explaining this. And it's that concept of what people think they're explaining and all the people in that process and how they think what the information means. And then of course, finally, what the client really needs. So we're also moving into this augmented age where this collaborative thing of humans and robots working together is more powerful than a human or a robot or a machine or a computer working on its own. The problem we have here is that we've still got that same issue where the way we communicate between humans and machines and computers is still limited and still have that, that problem with trying to communicate the information correctly. So we've got a lot of technology that's come on board. We've got things like virtual reality headsets and mixed reality headsets. And they're certainly helping us with this interface between the machine and the human. However, the problem we're seeing is that most of these headsets aren't really getting used appropriately. A lot of offices will have these, but they're, they're generally stuck in a room down the back of the office somewhere. Uh, a, a lot of staff are either too scared to go and try it or uh, even worse, they feel that the technology isn't relevant to their job. So really, we're left with everyone pretty much still working on a computer using an interface that's 30 plus years old where all we've got is a 2D screen that we use as our output and the only input we have is a keyboard or a mouse. So my team at Oricon, we're working to try and change this for us. So we're looking at making these things so they're not toys but they're actual tools. And for us, mixed reality is more than just a digital model and a headset. For us, it's about capturing the world around us, really pulling in all that information and blending it with a digital space. So the 3D design space, the simulation side of things, and optimization. And then finally, blending that all together in a way that we can pull virtual, augmented, or mixed reality and effectively bring us into this augmented intelligence age and hopefully give our engineers and our designers superpowers. So, like most of you in this room today, uh, where our company is spread across multiple offices and in the ideal situation, every one of those offices would have the same level of experts. However, it's not really possible to do that because your local area might not need those experts. So, thanks to the internet, we can, we can do collaborative work and we can have people spread all around the world and we can share around that work. So we can do things like Skype calls to talk about meetings, we can, um, we can do work sharing for Revit files and we can work all around the world. But what happens when your file or your, your project isn't a Revit file? What happens when it's a 200 foot cliff that was left after an earthquake and you've got houses on the top of it that need moving, um, you've got the slope that needs stabilizing? Well, you can't exactly package up and work share a cliff around the world, so instead you have to fly people in. And even worse is once they get there, you've then got to fly them to the site so they can see this cliff up close. So you put them in helicopters to start with. Um, they can obviously only get so far. Uh, you can put them in a cage and hang them from a crane. Um, but again, you're limited by the reach of that crane and where it can get to on that site. So the next option, of course, is to train them in ropes um, so they can abseil down and get to that site and look at the rock face. 
But all of these options are either highly expensive or worse, they put all our staff at risk. So our team's been working with drones for a number of, a number of years. And we thought, why can't we, why can't we improve on the process that we were doing there and try and remove the need to put our people in these situations? So what we did was we developed a solution that allows us to take cheap off-the-shelf drones and through a process of optimizing those flight paths, we're able to then generate models that have got enough high precision that we can then start using that in the design phase. So what you see here on the left is the raw video feed from the drone and on the right is our model. Once we've done that, we can then bring that into the office, we can put it on the meeting room table, and we can have meetings around it, explore it, we can understand that site. We can then run things like rockfall simulations over that model, and we can pull that data and put it overlap back over the model so that we can then have a meeting before we go to site or even remove the need to go to site so we can highlight things like where are the no-go zones, where is it unsafe to be, uh, we can highlight things like the different types of rock layers or the drainage areas. However, this, this is a fantastic tool. It saves us all this hassle of going to site and learning about the safety hazards while we're there. But then we wanted our engineers, our geologists, and our geotechnical engineers to be able to actually interact with it. So we built some tools in VR that allow them to do this. So this is Charlie, one of our geologists, and he can now inspect the site from the safety of the office. We've also built a machine learning layer on it that will actually look at the site for us and highlight all the areas that are important that Charlie needs to now go and look at. Now, what, what happens when your client or your end user isn't a geologist or a geotechnical engineer, but instead it's someone like a city planner or just the general public? So when we're rolling out things like a new cycleways design around the city, so this is new, light, uh, new cycle lanes all, around the, all spread around the city, um, the problem is we're still designing these sorts of things for the concept stage in 2D. We generate these plans that are like these long plans and with different options on them, and then we go out to the public or the city councils and we, we have them try and choose the options based on this. But just like the limited information I gave you about the house, to some people, these mean nothing. And to ask people to try and interpret this and figure out what that design's gonna be is quite impossible. So we create other things, like cross-sections. However, if you don't understand this either, you get questions like, why is there a tree coming out of that car? And then you've gotta try and explain, well, no, that's just where the section is, and, it, and then, the, well, why, how can that car park there if there's a tree there? And so instead, we create things like photo montages. Now, the thing I find strange about these is everyone's always smiling in these images. And if you look close, um, the girl on the bike, I think she's almost gonna hit that pole. So the other thing is you only get to see what's in this one image and you don't really get to feel what it's like to be in that space. So we went to our team and said, well, why are you still designing in this 2D space and why is this all you're trying to communicate? And we said, why don't we just buy a bike so we bought this bike, we bought some of the trackers from Vive, and we fabricated these parts that allow us to now track this, the handlebars and the brakes on the bike. But when it came to trying to track the speed of the bike, uh, we were limited on the constraints of the, the tight space to locate that and needing to be able to get clearance for it. So we turned to Autodesk Generative Design, we measured up the frame, we loaded in all the constraints about where it could actually look and to make sure it wasn't blocking the tracker, uh, we loaded up the forces that were going to be on the chain and then pushing onto the tracker. And then we let it go through and work through a whole solution set. And then it generated some design options for us and we, put, we chose one, printed it out, and then we were able to mount it on the bike and now we were able to track steering, we were able to track the brakes, and we were able to track the speed of that bike. So we pulled it into virtual reality. We loaded up our design options for these new cycle lanes. And it, it worked great, however, for the people on the bike, they, they could have been anywhere in the world because we didn't have anything to really reference them to what the world was around them. It was basically just the street design and it could have been in the desert. So what we did was we were lucky enough to be the first people in New Zealand to get our hands on one of these new BLK, BLK scanners. So we went out and we scanned the entire street. 
um, we then pulled in that point cloud information. And then we were able to stream that into our virtual reality experience. And even by keeping it at limited detail, it was enough for people to understand where it was they were in the world, and they were able to really understand what changes were happening to the street that they're used to biking down which was fantastic, especially for the people like the shop owners and trying to understand what was gonna to happen to the street frontage in front of them. So now we're really able to explore in a way that you can truly understand what design options are and the safety hazards. Um, we're also doing things like tracking the vision that you experience and we're, we're tying that in to try and find blind spots to figure out where cars and bikes won't be able to see each other. So, the next thing for us was, what else, could we en what else could we enable our engineers and our designers to do? What, how could we provide some more superpowers for them as such? So we would just moved into a new office earlier this year, and we wanted to understand how that office was actually operating. So the first thing we did was we, we built these low-cost little sensors that we were able to put around the office. So we printed up these mounts, um, we positioned them all around the office, and we were able to track just simple things like temperature and humidity, and then, once we've done that, we then built a web viewer that allows us to actually explore all that information in real time and truly understand what was happening in that space. And because we were the engineers on the project, it meant that we had a full access to all of the, the Revit files. We knew exactly what had been put into this space. So we were able to take those models and we could run some simulations. So we could do the airflow simulation that would come out of the vent uh, we could run some different options of the shape of those vents so that we could direct the air downwards if we needed. Um, the problem is when you run CFD simulations like this, trying to explore it on a 2D screen is, is almost impossible to really understand what's going on. Uh, there's a lot of cross sections you have to try and cut and move around and orbit. So instead we said, well, what if we could just look around the room and understand what was happening? So we took the HoloLens and we created a system that allows us to see that information in real time. So when you put it on, you can look up, and you get to see this, the temperatures coming from those sensors, and you also get to see that airflow moving around the room around you. So the other thing was, that because it was a new office, and it was, um, there was a lot of technology went into our office, uh, especially to, to deal with the earthquakes, um, we, we found that a lot of our staff ended up having to do a lot of tours. So basically every time a client came in, it's taken up a lot of our time just exploring the space. So we said, well, why don't we just take our experts that are doing these tours and why don't we turn them into holograms and actually have them give people tours. So now people like Sean here can still be working up at his desk while he's also giving a tour around the office and explaining things like the, the base isolators that are below the column right in front of him. So the examples I've shown today are just a few of the things our team's working on, but what I'm hoping is that these few options are enough to sort of inspire you and hopefully help you sort of want to move beyond the interfaces that we're dealing with today to a more sort of empowered future where, in theory, we're giving our designers superpowers. Thank you.